there is no cookie cutter solution for a pricing model. Mm -hmm. The idea of a pricing model is to customize it for your company. Hi friends, welcome to Business Briefs, where we indulge in bite-sized legal and business tips for you, our everyday clients and our small businesses out there. We are so excited today to have the very talented pricing expert and a business consultant, Patty Block, with us. And she is going to be teaching us all things about valuing ourselves, valuing our businesses, but then also how to level ourselves up for the next thing. We were just chatting, like literally right before this recording. And just something I think that's very prevalent in most business owners, especially women, is pricing. But we'll get to that. Patty, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us how you even started this consulting business of yours. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I'm Patty Block. My focus is I work only with women business owners. And the reason is that's where I know I have the biggest impact. So the Block Group which I started in 2006, is the second company that I've owned. The first focused on political consulting and lobbying. And I loved it. It was fascinating, and I'd never do it again. (laughs) I had that company for about eight years. And what I realized is I was continually frustrated because I really didn't know how to price, how to sell, how to address issues that were coming up especially how I was feeling inside. And if there were resources to help me grow my business and deal with all of that frustration, I didn't know how to find the resources and I didn't know who to trust. So I figured I need to learn this all myself. And that's what I started to do, taking dozens and dozens of programs like we all do, Mm -hmm. right? Because many of us are lifelong learners and it's fun and interesting and exciting. So we take all these programs. What I recognized was almost all the programs I was taking were designed by men for men Mm -hmm. and they didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And as I was talking to other women business owners, it wasn't working for them either. But we all assume, oh, well, but it's me. I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to start developing methods designed by a woman for women business owners, because we face different challenges Mm -hmm. than our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. So that began my journey of wanting to be that resource for other women business owners. Now, we all think that life is a straight line when we're kids. Then we grow up and realize, no, it's really not. Yeah, And that has been the case for me, that eye-opening experience. All of a sudden, I'm 35 years old. I have three little kids at home, a thriving political consulting business, and a surprise divorce. And realized very quickly that because I was doing political consulting and lobbying, the lobbying required a lot of travel. And I needed health insurance for the kids. I anticipated I wasn't going to have financial support, and I didn't. So at that time, my youngest was about two years old, and he just turned 31. So I have raised my children. I have raised good human beings, which was always my goal. And they're now all three business owners. Amazing. That's amazing. And of course, you have been so influential in their life, whether they acknowledge it or not. And I'm hoping they do. But you know, with all the tools that you're teaching so many other business owners out there and helping them also, you know, learn more about how to set their businesses up in a way that is thriving, that is sustainable as well. You're also an author, you've written the book, Your Hidden Advantage, which is right behind you. I see that. And you're helping people unlock their hidden advantage. Now, what does that even mean? So we all have an advantage and sometimes multiple advantages, but we may not recognize them. And sometimes it takes a third party to bring it to our attention. And I really question why that advantage is hidden even from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a simple example. Years ago, I 
developed this exercise where I would work with an accountability partner and I would write down everything that I think their clients valued about them. And they would write down everything they thought my clients valued. And then we exchanged. And at the top of the list, and if you do this exercise, I will tell you, you are very likely to be surprised because there are things on the list that you would never have thought of for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised because at the top of the list that I got from my partner was, you're always calm. You Mm -hmm. have a calming voice. And that is probably super valuable to your clients. Yeah. So I started testing it. I went to my clients, I went to my colleagues, and they said, Oh, of course, of course, that's one of the first things I would say about you. Yeah. Well, I would never have put that on my list. Because I don't think about having a calming voice or having a calm demeanor as something that is valuable. And that's true for all of us. Mm -hmm. So going through that exercise was really eye opening for me. And from that, you start to understand how others perceive you Mm -hmm. and what they find valuable. So when I ask my clients this question about what do you think of putting this as one of my advantages? And they would say, yes, because when I'm feeling freaked out, I know I can call you Mm -hmm. and you're going to be calm and you're going to share a different perspective with me. And I count on that. So again, things I would not have put on my list. Those hidden advantages are hidden often from yourself and very often from your audience, from your clients, because as women, we don't talk about those things. Mm -hmm. And we feel as though if we do talk about our accomplishments, our achievements, and our hidden advantages, we feel like we're bragging. Mm -hmm. But I'm based in Texas, and here we have a saying that it's not bragging if it's true. And I believe that. And every woman that I know is so accomplished and is a high achiever and a lifelong learner and really skilled at what she does, and we don't talk about that. Yeah, gosh, I'm from Texas, and I don't know if I've heard that, but I'm going to use it now. (laughs) I think you're so right. I think, uh, first of all, I absolutely agree with him because at first, like, even when I said hello to you, you have such a calm demeanor about yourself. And even when you were like lobbing, I'm like, I bet you were so good and persuading just because you're so calm and collected when you were talking, because it just seems like a great advantage to have because a lot of us are not like that, especially if you're in a fast paced industry, you know? Lobbying is very fast paced. What you're doing right now is also very fast paced with, you know, high level business owners and, you know, company CEOs and all that. So it's truly such an advantage that you do have. And I love this exercise. And I'm actually going to do this with one of my, as they call the business bestie or, you know, whoever your business person is, your person, it can even be your spouse, maybe. What do you suggest doing it with your spouse even or? Sure. Someone that you trust, I will say, I think it's more effective when it's a business owner that is at the same point in the journey that you are Ah. so that you're really peers. And I think that's where it can be the most powerful. Right. Right. Oh gosh. Great. I love this little exercise. I think it'd be so helpful for me as well. And for everybody listening too. So I know that you transitioned from, you know, political world into the consulting world. And what was that transition like? Was it easy? Was it tough? Because I know you were also mentioning about your personal life, you know, also being up and down and, you know, a little bit complicated at that time. So how did you overcome all of that and go through all of that without feeling so defeated emotionally and mentally? So I'll start by saying I did feel defeated. I felt like such a failure. And I was so caught off guard by the divorce. Mm -hmm. So I had to let go of so many things. I had to let go of my marriage, my family as I knew it, my business, because I needed to close my political consulting business, which I had really built to be very successful and had built my reputation. And I loved the work. Mm -hmm. So it was very heartrending for me and a lot of grieving. 
Yeah. And that is not something that happens overnight. That takes time and a good therapist. <laughs> and so that's what I did is I realized my kids are really little. Their world is turning upside down. I need to stabilize things for my kids and for myself, and I need to go get a job. Mm -hmm. And this is a temporary measure. I knew I was going to start my company again. I kind of thought I would go back into political work, but over time realized that wasn't where my heart was. My heart was with helping other women business owners. Yeah. And so I took a job at an international school as director of development, handling marketing, public relations, and fundraising and then became director of operations. So that was a fabulous experience. You know, I'm around kids and families and and had a lot of responsibility and could affect a lot of change. So that was a great experience. I stayed for almost nine years, letting my kids get older and more independent. Then it also gave me some time to save so I could start this company in 2006. And that shift, by that time, I knew that I wanted to bring my experience in finance and operations to the small business market. So then it was clear to me, I could start that business as a business consultant and focus on women business owners. So that's how that all came about. It was an easy transition from the standpoint of feeling very ready mm -hmm. and preparing for it. Pretty much the entire time I was at the international school, I was planning this company. Right, right. So that built my confidence. It felt right, even though it was a huge leap of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still a single mom. I still have kids that are headed towards college. And I knew that was all going to land on my shoulders. So when I started this company, I had a very specific business development strategy of how I wanted to acquire clients. Now, it was not all smooth sailing. I definitely took people that ended up not being my ideal clients. I definitely priced too low. I definitely leaned into hourly billing, which I never recommend. <laughs> and over time was able to evolve and build these programs to teach other women how you can effectively price for value, yeah. how you can attract your right fit buyers, and how you can communicate effectively and with confidence. Goodness, I think we all need that in life. And just to kind of talk a little bit about your strategy, and you're like, I had a strategy in my mind. Was that something that you conceived or maybe you conceived, but you had help develop also? Like, what was that process like? For those that are wanting to start or have ideas of shifting and pivoting, where do you look to for strategy and development of that strategy? Where I started was with my political contacts. We all have a network. And one of the things that I think really limits us, especially as women, we don't want to bother anybody. We don't want to trouble anyone. We have friends and colleagues but if we haven't talked to them in a while, we feel like we're using them if we go back and connect. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you think about how you feel when somebody connects with you and you haven't talked to them for a while, aren't you kind of flattered? Yeah. Aren't you kind of pleased that they thought of you and they reached out and they wanted to reconnect? And yet, we don't give ourselves that same grace. Mm -hmm. And so... My feeling was I have spent years and years building this network. And yes, I was out of touch for some years. But when I went back, there were two things. One was they were very happy to hear from me mm -hmm. and very happy to catch up and find out what had been going on. Mm -hmm. But the other was that I found kind of funny was they assumed I was going back into political work mm -hmm. and they were so excited because now I could be helpful to them. Yeah. And I think they were a little disappointed when I said, my focus is helping women business owners boost their revenue, attract right fit clients. This is the path that I'm taking. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going back into political work. And one of the huge challenges with political work 
is that you're in a position to compromise your ethics every single day. And I, you know, again, I love the work. And most of the people I worked with were fine individuals, and some were not. And dealing with those egos and the feeling of needing to compromise my ethics, which I just wasn't willing to do, that challenge was an everyday thing and it really wears you down. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine a lot of friction with values and then having to support or consult with people who are opposite of your value system. That would be a challenge for me on a very real level. That would be a super challenge for me as well. Now, shifting gears a little bit, the women that you help and the small businesses that you help, if you know somebody's in your pipeline and they're part of your client community, what are some of the most common issues that your community is facing in the, in the people that you're serving? The biggest one is pricing. Yeah. And let me share with you, when I was growing up, my mom made these fabulous cookies. The whole house smelled good. It was warm. The cookies were gooey. And all my life, I watched my mom eat the broken cookies. But it wasn't until I was a teenager that I even thought to ask her, why do you only eat the broken cookies? Do they taste better? And she laughed and said, no, I eat the broken cookies so you can have the whole ones. And this memory came rushing back to me several years ago when I was struggling to put language around this pervasive pattern that I saw in the decades that I've worked with women business owners. And what I recognized was, as women, we're undervaluing ourselves, we are underpricing our services, and then we're over-delivering. So we sacrifice our profit. And what we're really doing is we are modeling what we saw with our role models, our mothers and our grandmothers, who brought this spirit of self-sacrifice to everything they did. And we as women grew up that way. So we're bringing that right into our business. Mm -hmm. And everyone around us, our staff, our clients, our families, everyone gets the whole cookie. And we're living on crumbs. It's what I call the broken cookie effect. And it is very pervasive. Even if you've been in business 10 years, 15 years, you may still struggle with pricing for value. And it doesn't have to be that way. So when you start to understand that building a pricing model helps your client and your potential buyer as much as it helps you because you feel more confident, then it's not personal. It's not that you're pricing low or high or you're pricing based on the value that you know you provide. And your potential buyers will understand that better. They will question your pricing much less frequently. And they will understand the value that you're bringing because I teach a sales process that helps you build that value every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that you've said the value that you bring because there is I don't know if it's a debate, but it's definitely something that you hear a lot in the online business community, in the creative entrepreneur community as well, and small businesses in general, like they're all small businesses. It's about worth. I need to price what my worth is. I cringe at it a little bit. And the reason is because I'm like, well, my worth is like priceless. There is no price on the worth of me. But there's definitely a price on the value that I'm bringing to the table, like the stuff, the work that I'm doing and, you know, the end result and everything in between. What are your thoughts on this? I agree with you. And you'll notice I didn't use the word worth. Yeah, I did notice that. Effective pricing is not about your worth. And I believe every human has innate worth Mm -hmm. and innate value as a human, right? But- When we get into business, first of all, a lot of us come out of a corporate career and we are taught, first of all, we often don't have responsibility for pricing. Mm -hmm. We have to sell what the firm tells us to sell and we don't get to choose the pricing. And especially in professional services, that hourly billing model is drilled into our heads. Mm -hmm. 
So when you think about the time that you're putting into something, it skews how you view pricing Mm -hmm. because it's not about the time. You're not, it's not what you're selling. You are selling your expertise, your experience, the results that you get for your clients. As I said, the value that you're really bringing. Mm -hmm. And we always underestimate that for ourselves. So I often say effective pricing is not about what you're worth. It's about the results that you get for your clients and the way you interact and the way that you help them get to the next stage for whatever they want to do. And that value is so high. The other thing I want to mention that we often overlook is that part of what we believe as human beings is that low quality equates with low price Mm -hmm. and high quality equates with high price. So when you know that your potential buyer is coming to you with that thinking, think of it as the retail example of Walmart, Macy's, and Neiman Marcus. Mm -hmm. And you can buy a blouse in all three stores, but which woman shops in which store (laughs) depends on how much she can spend and what what she thinks is important. Mm -hmm. That's true of the buyers coming to you as well. They come to you with a preconceived notion. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking with you, Mm -hmm. right? So they come to you knowing that you offer value, but they need to be educated about what kind of value, how you provide that, what's important to you, seeing if y'all align with how you're going to approach this issue or this business problem. And what they're really listening for is, is their preconceived notion of you and of your company correct? Mm. And you have the opportunity as you're visiting with them, as you're taking them through your sales process, you have that opportunity to build value and to confirm that yes, they would get tremendous value from working with you. But by the time you get to pricing, there is no conflict. There Mm -hmm. is no objection because they already understand the value. So that's the basis of what I teach in building structure around your pricing. Mm -hmm. And yes, you may need to increase your pricing, but not always. Sometimes it's how you package it. And that again, plays to how you're being perceived. Mm -hmm. Gosh, so much wisdom in everything you just said. And it's just such a great perspective because, you know, that narrative constantly is playing in so many social media all over the place, you know, my worth, my this, I go to conferences and they're like, my worth, like, how do you, how do you distinguish yourself? I distinguish myself, you know, like, okay, yeah. But like at the end of the day, you're part of the product and the package and the services because it is you that people are wanting to come to also, but ultimately still the tangible that they're pricing that you are putting the value on. And that, and I think that's like sometimes difficult to separate in a lot of people's minds, especially with the narrative that's going on. And I'm so glad, you know, you flushed that out a little bit more and that we agree to. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it brings a lot of like, Oh, like, can we, can we shift that conversation? But you so eloquently explained that. And so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And it's really like strategy, the way you're looking at it. And you've spoken so much strategy in just your explanation, you know, on how to even perceive the work that you're putting out there and what your client is thinking or your potential client is thinking when they walk into the room. I have another question on that. It's follow up is what if you don't perceive yourself to be that high level? And what if you're thinking that the potential client that's coming in is looking for something that's cheap, but they're getting what they need, but at a cheap value? How do you reconcile those thoughts? It's a great question because what you're speaking to is your underlying confidence. Mm -hmm. And everything that I've built that I teach is about building your confidence. So some of that is by simplifying. Some of that is by maybe raising your prices. Some of that is by adding structure, like a pricing model. Some of that is clearly defining who is your ideal buyer and where are you going to find them? 
Mm -hmm. A lot of us as women were waiting for the phone to ring. And that is fine. It works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then you need to find your ideal buyers and visit with them and help them understand the kind of value that you provide and the kind of solutions Mm -hmm. that you bring. So again, as long as you have only an inbound business development strategy and you're waiting for the phone to ring, that is very limiting. Mm -hmm. So let me go back to your question about your inner confidence. As you build these tools and you have a sales process, lots of people don't. Mm -hmm. Lots of people create it for every new buyer. Mm -hmm. So when you have a sales process, you have a pricing model, you have all these tools that you've built, it builds your own confidence. And you start to understand how people are perceiving you and you test everything that you're doing. So there is no cookie cutter solution for a pricing model. Mm -hmm. The idea of a pricing model is to customize it for your company, for your needs to represent the value. And part of that is we do have to detach a little bit because our business is our baby. Mm -hmm. And to your exact point, we are putting ourselves out there, right? That's one of the hardest things as a business owner is to put yourself out there and position your company in the market. And a lot of times we don't do that intentionally. So it happens by accident. You have a reputation, Mm -hmm. but you may not have chosen that reputation. And that shakes our confidence. Hmm. So all of the tools that I teach, I feel so passionately about this because when you have those tools in place and you feel that inner confidence, then you you can bring that confidence into every conversation you have, everything that you're doing inside your business. If you have staff, what kind of leader you are, all of those pieces come together like a puzzle and then your potential buyer is excited. They get excited about working with you Mm -hmm. because they understand the value and they understand what it's going to be like to work with you. And they understand what kinds of results you can get. And that does not happen by accident. That has to be built. It's what I call perceived value. Mm -hmm. And the good news is as women, we're actually really good at building perceived value because it's about building and developing the relationship. And we're really good at that, but we often do not do that intentionally. Mm. And that can keep us very limited and frustrated. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now these tools that you're talking about, could you share with us some of these tools and are they available? I know that you're saying that, you know, in what you teach and your consultations, and then of course the book that you have, I'm pretty sure they're all available there as well, right? Yes. And the best place to start is with the book Mm -hmm. and it's called Your Hidden Advantage, How to Unlock Your Power to Attract Right Fit Clients and Boost Your Revenue. And Your Hidden Advantage has exercises through the book. There's also a link in the book where you can go and download the exercises Mm -hmm. because I personally was taught to never write in a book. So (laughs) even though you have the exercises in the book, I couldn't make myself write in the book. So you have the exercises, you can download them. And those are the tools that you can start with to identify and define your ideal buyer. Mm -hmm. Make a distinction between an ideal buyer and an ideal client. Mm. Those are two very different things to me. And an ideal client does not happen by accident. So kind of like your reputation could happen by accident, you could have an ideal client who by accident becomes ideal, but it is so much more effective when you can do that intentionally. Mm -hmm. And that starts in the onboarding process when they become a client. So everything that I talk about is your ideal buyer, because that's about how do you find the person that is going to understand the value and he is going to appreciate all the things that you're bringing to help them. Mm -hmm. So then you can help them become an ideal client. 
So starting with the book and the exercises is a great way to start and will help you develop some of those tools. From there, I have a program called Value Driven Pricing. And that is my signature program because my belief is you can become an expert salesperson. You can go out and sell all day long. But if you haven't addressed your pricing issue, you're still not going to be profitable. Right. You're still going to feel frustrated and angry and resentful because you may feel like you're being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And that is of our own making. So getting those tools in place, Mm -hmm. building your pricing model, and then building your confidence. In fact, one major part of the book is about how do you communicate effectively? Mm -hmm. Some of the pitfalls that we experience as women. So just like feeling like you're bragging when you're not bragging if it's true. Yeah. So shifting how you think about some of your core beliefs, like I price based on what the market can bear. I hear that all the time. Mm. There is no such thing as what the market can bear. Because if you don't like the market that you're in, you have the ability to change it. Yeah, and find a market who really does understand the value. So using that excuse of, oh, I have to price based on what the market will bear, or I have to be fair. I want to be fair to my clients, and I need to price in a fair way and a really low way so that I can work with more people. Mm -hmm. And The only person who can decide if your pricing is, quote, fair, is your buyer. Yeah. So you're undermining your credibility, your confidence by using those false beliefs as excuses. And so that's a big part of shifting the way you're thinking, of attracting right fit buyers, assessing your value which is all about pricing for value and then communicating effectively with confidence so that people really understand where you're coming from. Oh gosh. So many golden nuggets right there. Amazing. How do we connect with you? Where do we buy the book? And then where else can we connect with you? If you'll go to yourhiddenadvantage.com, you will find some bonuses Mm -hmm. that are companion pieces for the book. There's a video training, there's an article. So take advantage of those free bonuses to get a sense of where you can start to build these tools. You can also buy the book there. It's on Amazon, Your Hidden Advantage. And of course, go to yourhiddenadvantage.com to get the bonuses as well as buy the book. You can also reach out to me through my website. Mm -hmm. And if you do so, please mention this podcast so I can make that mental connection. Awesome. I love that. And are you on Instagram? Are you on any social media? I am on social media, but primarily LinkedIn. Perfect. Awesome. Well, we will be putting all those links into the show notes. And before we say goodbye and thank you, I wanted to ask you, what is your anchor? What holds you steady when there's chaos around you? Well, I've worked very hard to eliminate the chaos in my life, and it's taken years, but I'm now at the point where there's a lot less chaos, and I'm grateful for that. And I think the anchor for me has always been my family. Mm -hmm. It has been my extended family, my siblings, my parents. It has been my children for sure. And now that my children are adults and we help each other in our businesses, we all have complimentary businesses. Yes. So we help each other in our businesses. And that is so gratifying. And that really is my anchor. So I'm so grateful. I will also say I have worked very hard to build that, to have those relationships and never take them for granted. Great advice, because I think a lot of times uh, we underestimate the power of connections and the power of the network and the community that we're building. So I think absolutely there's so much value in having, you know, goodwill or however you want to call it, rapport or, you know, that solid connection that you might have. So 
Thank you so much, Patty. You have shared such, like I just said earlier, like so many golden nuggets with us throughout this conversation. I know that you have absolutely addressed an issue that is very prevalent in the women entrepreneurship community, as well as others. You know, a lot of other people, when you're first starting out, especially have a problem and difficulties in figuring out the pricing and being confident about it. So I am looking forward to actually purchasing your book and reading your book also. And thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. This has been great. 